everybody, and welcome to another episode of God is Not a Theory with Ken Fish. I'm your host, Grant Pemberton. And on today's episode, Ken and I are just going to have a fireside chat. Uh, there's no fireplace, but uh, we're just going to have a chat about um, what has transpired uh, at IHOP. And uh, over the last several months, um, we've had uh, multiple people from there on our podcast uh, from time to time and participated in different things. And uh, we feel like uh, Ken especially feels like it's something that he needs to speak to. So, Ken, uh, I know this is difficult. There's uh, there's a long history there um, with, uh, you know, going all the way back to to your time in Anaheim um, and the, uh, you know, the history with Anaheim and uh, in Kansas City Fellowship at the time and uh, and Mike Bickle. And so I know there's a lot there and uh and and so i know that you've been um prayerfully you know uh taking this into account and, and when to say what and all of that and honestly we covered a, a pretty good job although we didn't quite name names uh several episodes ago when we talked about um you know the idea of uh being able to uh have the benefit of of something even if it was in a broken vessel we use the church history Right. And um, and all of that as a way to address. I thought you did that uh, so brilliantly, but um, we, you felt like you wanted to speak a little bit more directly uh, into this, and uh, and so um, yeah, I, I guess first of all, let me let me just ask you because you know this is something that's affecting a lot of folks, and uh, and with the history, I mean, you know, it's been a a ride since you know October, I guess, is when all of this broke. Uh, with the stories and so you know just kind of want to check in with you and and how are you feeling and um, you know how have you been through this uh, through this time and and what are your takeaways well I've seen other uh, church leaders rise and fall Um, I can remember several very prominent people with whom I didn't really have relationships and they had moral failings a couple of them were monetary not money and not uh, sexual but more of them that that I've observed over the last few decades have been in the area of sexual falls. Um, you know, this is a hard topic to talk about because I want to, like everybody, I want to give the those who have been victimized, I want to give them a chance to be heard. And I, you know, I, I'm not sure what the right uh, restitution is, and I'm not sure if IHOP gives it, if Mike gives it. I, I don't, I'm not sure what that looks like. Um, and I'm glad I'm not in charge of determining that either. Uh, I'm simply pointing out that it's it's a hard thing to get clear. So that's, that's my first point is, you know, we, we don't want to fail to acknowledge that there's been victimization has gone on. Um, so, all right, now that we've said that, um, you know, this is also a disaster, a catastrophe, really, for Mike and his wife and his sons and anyone who's been watching the news reports that have been coming out. And there have been multiple places you could uh, collect this kind of information. The Roy's report from uh, Julie Roy's is one of the big ones that people have been using. A remnant radio has done um, some broadcasts on this. And, um, you know, there have been these periodic releases from various people. But most recently, there was one statement released by eight specific well-known individuals that include, uh, again, my friend Jack Deere, Sam Storms, who has been on this podcast, and uh, some others, Michael Brown. And, you know, they were laying out point by point what they thought was the right path forward. And they said, you know, in our considered opinion... Uh, Mike should never be returned to ministry. I had reached the conclusion that that was whether or not it was. Let me. What I'm trying to do is take out any of the moral impetus of should or ought. I'd reached the conclusion that Mike never would return to ministry. Um, again, whether he should or not. And the reason I had come to that conclusion was because the preponderance of evidence coming out, uh, including this report of uh, pedophilia when, and that's a much, much older story, but nevertheless, it occurred. Um, And then, you know, these various Jane Does that were coming forward that go back in some cases quite a ways, but were apparently still going on. I mean, all of this together, I just thought, I don't know how he's going to return to ministry because for someone who has, you know, eaten up the supply of trust, the love bank is what they refer to it in marriage counseling, but 
the trust bank, when that has been depleted, um, the reservoir is dry. It takes a long time to rebuild trust and confidence. And Mike's 68 years old. So I don't know what, and, and, I, and I'm, I'm speaking in the hypothetical here. I want to be very clear about that. But if Mike were hypothetically going to return to ministry, and we've already said we have this statement that's come out by eight, you know, very visible leaders in the in the body of Christ saying he should never return to ministry. And then I said I'd concluded that he never would return to ministry, whether or not he should or shouldn't or could be restored or not be restored. The reasoning is simply that at 68 years old, I don't know how long someone would need to be set down, but there's been a persistent pattern of deception that's gone on for a long time, or a double life, say it the way you want. And as I thought about it, okay, he's 68. I don't know what, how long do you need to be in the penalty box? Five years? 10? Three? I don't know. There's no, there's no guideline on this. But let's just assume for a minute that it's five years, and you don't have to agree with that number. Again, this is a hypothetical situation. Well, by then, Mike would be uh, 73 years old. And if his health were strong enough and he had the energy, perhaps he might be able to you know, rally the troops again one more time. But it would take a long time coming back from that to be able to start building trust. In other words, you're on the bench. You don't build trust while you're on the bench. You're out of the game. Once you're back in the game, then you start building trust. And, you know, to have come from a place where a couple million people were following him and to, you know, be restored, I, I just, I didn't see how it could possibly happen. And so before the, uh, the group of eight came out with their recent statement, I had concluded Mike will not return to ministry. I hope the way I'm saying this is clear, but feel free to ask me questions about it if you would like. Yeah, I, th I think what you're saying is uh, whether or not he should or not is a moot point because just uh, the the numbers uh, right. of, I mean, you know, essentially it's over 30 years. So let's say he, let's say he has to do one to one in the penalty box. Uh, you know, then you're looking at uh, in his hundreds. Uh, don't see that happening. So I think for you, what you're saying is like it's just not even a. Uh, something to consider because it's just out of the realm, we hope, of uh, of possibility uh, here. And I don't like saying that because um, Mike has been a friend of mine. Now, when you have a long-term friendship, especially with someone who's as visible as he's been, at times you're closer and at times you're less close. But when we've been close, we've we've been close. And when we weren't, well, then we weren't. So, okay. Um, but I've known him since uh, the first Vineyard team went to Kansas City with John Wimber. And I'm pretty sure the year was 1982. If it wasn't, maybe it was 83 or four. Um, I did have a conversation with Mike about this once, and we kind of got into the dates. And, you know, he, he kind of had a steel trap mind when it came to things like that. So he said it, he thought it was in 1984. Or did he say four? He may have said 85. So maybe he's right and I'm not. But the point is, it's been around 40 years that I've known him. And initially, I just wanted to withhold judgment. And I advised everybody, you know, just wait for the report to come out. And then we'll see what we've got here. Because I didn't want people to rush to judgment. I didn't want them to jump to conclusions. There hasn't been a report. And part of it's been because the process didn't really work. And when Mike issued an admission of guilt, it was somewhat vague. And but he did admit guilt. So at least we have that. And then the process of ex investigating this, it seemed like every time it would move forward, it would break down. And so there still hasn't been, you know, like an official readout from an independent third party that everyone can look at and say, we think this was done, you know, impartially. That, that's not to say Mike's right, by the way. Impartial simply means there's no bias, no anger, no windage, no spin trying to make Mike look good, trying to make Jane Doe's one through N look bad. There's none of that sort of thing going on. It's just somebody conducted an investigation and said, here's what we found. We've interviewed everybody. Boom. Uh, but, it, but notwithstanding that that didn't go on, uh, this group of eight and some others have conducted investigations and 
looked around a bit at it. Um, Eric Voles recently wrapped up his assignment with Kansas City, and he stated when he was finished that, you know, the work was done. Well, the restoration work isn't done. And I don't mean Mike's. I mean, for the church, for, for IHOP. Uh, the church is forerunner. IHOP is the broader ministry. And I know that, but I'm just speaking kind of collectively here. Um, so the restoration work isn't complete, and it's not fully clear whether IHOP will survive. Uh, one of the things that that I personally have encountered is back in December, I was very concerned about the war with Gaza and Hamas. And uh, I talked with several key leaders in the body of Christ. And I said, you know, I think we need a new fast. And they said, yeah, we do too. Why don't you call it and we'll, you know, you write the reports and updates and stuff and we'll send them out. So I got nominated for that unenviable role. And we launched this newer fast uh, in December. And I, I wanted it to end before Christmas because I knew nobody was going to fast on Christmas. And so we wrapped it up by December the 22nd. But one of the things that was interesting was many of the local hops. And so, you know, wherever they're located, Grant, Grant you live in Nashville. So I suppose there has to be an N hop in Nashville. Um, you know, there's no. one near me called T hop for Torrance. All right, so they're generally designated by the first letter of the city in which they exist. But many of the leaders of the hops that I contacted gave me a pretty uniform answer. That each one said it a little differently, of course. This wasn't read off a script. But the, the uniform answer was that uh, they didn't want to be involved in another Israel fast like the one we did last May of 23. And the reason was that everybody assumed Mike was behind it and was using it to manipulate and to draw attention away from himself and the crisis and at IHOP. And so uh, because they didn't trust it, they didn't want to be part of it. And I had to tell him, well, look, I haven't talked to Mike. I haven't talked to the ELT in Kansas City about this. I simply felt the burden of the Lord for the situation in Israel, in Gaza, and the fighting. And you know, I thought we should mobilize prayer. And, and, you know, there were a lot of, as they say, pretty key leaders. We had kind of a council of 10 uh, that were involved in, you know, pulling this together and spreading the word. And, you know, it had fairly broad participation just by virtue of uh, Orbis and the these other leaders. But unless, well, as far as I know, not a single hop was willing to enter into this because they were so jaded, they were so disillusioned, they were so upset, they were so, they felt so betrayed. And I understand that. I want to be clear, I'm not throwing rocks at, at these various local hop entities. But what it tells me more than anything is that if they won't pray for Israel, which is one of the foundational tenets of the IHOP movement, uh, because of the fear of being manipulated or that, you know, Mike's trying to, you know, deflect, et cetera. Just that fear, if there's that level of fear and antipathy, I don't know how in the world he could ever rebuild the kind of trust that it takes to lead a movement. Right. Now, again, ask me questions because I don't know if I'm saying this as well as I should, but I, I'm trying to be clear and just kind of explain my own internal process and in thinking it through. Yeah. And can, you know, I know you and I know you don't like to, um, to really speculate and, uh, and there's this need somehow and uh, that uh, anytime anything ever happens, uh, there's this pressure that's put on leaders, uh, either externally or internally as well, I got to make a statement, I got to say something. And I know guys like you and me, uh, we kind of eschew that and say, you don't have to comment on everything, you know, and I know you're busy. And so you're not, you're not knowing the ins and outs of everything going on and um, you're not a part of any sort of investigation or any of that sort of thing. And so, you know, we don't want to gossip. We don't want to, you know, all of that sort of stuff. At the same time, you're rocking a hard place. You want to speak out and say, Hey, we're for, we're for the victims. We're for, uh, you know, justice coming here. You know, all of that sort of thing. It's just, we just don't have a lot of information. However, you know, he was on the podcast and we did uh, participate in the fast and, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, um, you know, you were there and all of that. And so it is, there is just this, it's just messy, you know? And, uh, and so I think, I think we can recognize that and say, uh, you know, you're not, you're not speaking for him. 
or anything like that. And I know communication has been non-existent. And so, um, you know, I just think people, uh, I, I think people need to hear some reassurance. I, I suppose that, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to do anything. I, we're, we believe, uh, those that are being abused and uh, believe their stories and, and weeping with those who are weeping and mourning with those that are mourning and, and recognizing it is a large scale of just hurt. And the vi- you have the victims that are, that have been abused. You have, um, all of the people that have given their lives to this, uh, the ministry. And well, I mean, it's just, it is a, it's, it's a bad, bad situation. And so, um, you know, I think we can all just sort of recognize that and you're in no way trying to defend, you know, Mike or anything like that. No, I'm not because obviously, you know, the behavior is not defendable, but, um, at least not morally and biblically. So, uh, you know, if you're, if you're trying to put spin on it, then I guess people might try. We, we watched president bill clinton put spin on what he did with monica Lewinsky, and so you know in in the political sphere maybe it could be but it can't be defended in the church and of course it it it's sobering because it's only a few years since we had the clergy slash pedophile priest scandal in the catholic church mm-hmm. and i know from my own journeys um and interactions with the Anglican church that this also touched the Anglican church. It was largely not noted in the wider press. Uh, But, you know, in many ways, the Anglican church looks like, um, I don't know, the Catholic church light. And uh, the liturgy is quite similar. And um, the belief about the sacrament is different. And so for those who want to nitpick theologically and send me emails and things, okay, fine. I'm aware. What I'm saying is by external uh, look, in many ways, the Anglican church is similar to the Catholic Church, and they too had a pedophile uh, clergy scandal dealing with their priests. And then more recently, there was something that came up with um, Liberty University and by extension, the Baptists. And so we've seen this hitting other branches of the church. And it just, it breaks your heart to think that there's so much of this going on. I think we all, anyone who's alive, knows the power of temptation, sexual temptation. Um, You know, when we were young, we all know what that was like uh, and whether we succumbed or resisted. I'm simply saying we know how great those temptations can be. And most of us in our youth would have experienced it then. And some people don't stop experiencing those temptations when they get married. And some people go on and succumb to them. So it's it, it can be a very difficult thing. And I, and I think, you know, with that one, I, 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 got, I got to a hotel room uh, on, in my journeys, my travels, uh, maybe around 10 days ago as, as we're making this recording. And I'd been binge listening to Julie Roy's and I'd been binge listening to Remnant Radio and I'd been reading the various statements and I, some of it I'd been keeping up with, but some of it I'd been too busy to keep up with. And I got in early enough that night that I could actually sit down and just kind of play everything and listen. And I got to the end and I just, I was sitting at the desk in the hotel room and I put my elbows on the desk, put my head in my hands and I just broke down crying. I just broke down weeping uh, that this could be going on in the body of Christ, that my friend had succumbed to it, uh, that the church, which should be a champion for those who are among the weaker or the oppressed or the somehow preyed upon, that this could be going on in, on such a widespread scale. And again, I, I deliberately noted the Catholics and the Anglicans and the Baptists. And, and don't think for a minute that that means the Presbyterians, Lutherans, and Assemblies of God were free of it either, because, you know, we all have heard various stories along the way. And so it, it just reminded me that we need to we need to pay more close attention to what we've heard. The writer to the Hebrews says that, and we need to be people who are um, scrupulous about how we live, knowing that it's not always easy to be scrupulous and that temptation is real. And if we if we aren't going to do that, I don't know how we're ever going to present any sort of witness to the world. No kidding, no kidding. And I think you know it is there is a if if 
if this doesn't, you know, cause you to reflect and say, okay, you know, there for the grace of God, right? Uh, go we, and and how are we structuring our lives and, and making sure that we have accountability and that we're submitting to to others and uh, as leaders and all of that, you know, certainly things um, that need to be, it just causes you to reflect uh, and to, to do that. Um, you know, Ken, I, I, again, uh, there's no new information. It's not like we are privy to anything. Uh, I just, uh, the feeling was, Hey, we probably should, should speak up and, and, uh, and offer support, uh, for the victims, for those that have been abused and, uh, and call like it is, um, for that. Uh, let me ask you this as far as, uh, in, in how the body of Christ, uh, particularly in the stream of, of charismatic, how, how should they be praying at this moment? What, what, what should be, you, I don't know if, if you've heard, I think I've sent you some of these, but there's a lot of, you know, prophetic quote unquote, uh, voices, um, that are saying, you know, there's more of this coming, uh, to, to the body of Christ and, and all of that. Uh, how should we be praying? How should we be approaching, uh, all, all of this? How should we be thinking? A lot of what we talk about is how, how should we think like a Christian? And how do we how do we think biblically uh, and pray biblically uh, in this time? Well, I guess, you know, first, let's pray for healing for those who have been uh, victimized. That's that's really important. And let's just say this clearly. God can heal. People do not need to you know, be ruined for life because of this. They, they can be healed by the Lord and move on so if people don't know where to find that healing they can get in touch with orbis and we'll either help them or we'll you know refer them on to people who can help them so i think that's number one Uh, so pray for their healing number two you know there's there was a point at which david was confronted um for numbering israel and he was confronted by the prophet nathan and nathan said well what do you want to do do you want to flee before your enemies do you want to have a plague uh, you know, what? How, how do you want this to happen? And David says, it's better to fall into the hands of the Lord for he is merciful. And so um, I would rather fall into the hands of the Lord than have to have this play out, uh, you know, being destroyed by my enemies, which of course many have had a go at Mike um, beyond the charismatic world even. And so um, we should pray for mercy on those who have made the mistakes. I know for some, they want vengeance, but the scripture says the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. And man means mankind, all humans. So the wrath of humanity does not work the righteousness of God. And the scripture also says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. So we should pray that the Lord's mercy will be seen by having him deal with people. Now, that might still mean they get exposed. That's a possibility. But, um, but I, again, if it's done under the Lord's impetus rather than because somebody decides to go out and thrash away at somebody, uh, that's a better outcome. Because even uh, those who are the perpetrators, they are still humans created in God's image. And God still does love them, even if he's unhappy with what they've done. So I think we need to pray for mercy. And then I think the third thing, and I'm not sure if this is more of a prayer point or just like a personal action plan, but, you know, this went on for decades and it went on in the presence of prophets. Uh, It went on in the presence of people who are generally regarded as very discerning and acute in their spiritual sensibilities. And yet it went on until it finally did come out. And so, um, what this really tells us is that if somebody is determined to hide something, usually they can do it, at least for a long time. I mean, look at Bernie Madoff, never mind the church. Look at what he did uh, with his Ponzi scheme that he was running through his hedge fund. And that was with auditors and SEC regulations and so forth. So I think the third thing is we have to we have to pray for our hearts to remain soft because you could easily become jaded and turn away from the church, turn away from its leaders and cease to give heed to them. Maybe not unlike what I ran into with the various hops, not wanting to participate in a prayer, you know, time for, for Israel. Oftentimes with these kinds of situations, 
the scripture comes to my mind, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And I think that happens. The sheep get scattered and people just like, forget it. I'm done with the church. I know several people who were close to me who were part of a, another situation years ago where a pastor fell and they literally walked away from the church and have never returned. And I, I believe that several of them have lost their faith. And so we don't want to be in that camp. And with that, we also want to be careful and guard our hearts that we don't fall into these same things because there is no sin that has overtaken anyone that is not common among men and women. So let's not assume that we will rise above this or be better than them or whatever. Um, and if, if you find yourself in a situation of temptation, do what Paul counseled Timothy, flee, flee youthful lust, just flee cut the lines and run. Joseph had to do it with uh, Potiphar's wife. And I think that remains sound counsel even to this day. Some people may have the self-mastery to overcome it and just say no, but many don't. And if you don't, fleeing is preferable to falling. Yeah. Well, hey, uh, I know that um, that you've got a lot going on. And so uh, we just ask you to, to take some time out here, but, um, but thanks for doing this. Thanks for being thoughtful. Uh, in in the way that you respond and uh, and how you handle this, and so uh, we're thankful for you. We're thankful for leaders uh, in in the body that uh, that are working diligently to finish the race well. So uh, keep up the good work, Ken, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you uh, next time on another episode of God is Not a Theory with Ken Fish. If you are interested in exploring courses with us at Orbis School of Ministry, click on the link in the description of this podcast or go to orbissm.com. You can also send any school-related inquiries to our registrar, Joe McKay at joe at orbisministries.org. That's j-o at orbisministries.org.